introduce Dr. Larry Marshall, the CEO of CSIRO. Thanks, but I haven't done anything yet, but thank you. Um, <laughs> I think we'll dispense with the, um, the voting, otherwise we're going to run uh, smack into 5 p.m., but if I can just have the slide deck, that would be great. We'll, we'll do it a little bit differently. But let's just skip through this. Can we just go to the slides? <laughs> you, got, you got an answer anyway. <laughs> yeah, thanks. And the next one. Oh, do I have a clicker? Yes, right there. Oh, awesome, thank you. Great. And it's this one? Great. Um, what does everyone notice most about this chart? Someone yell out. What's the most conspicuous feature on this chart? The hole. The hole oh. in the middle, right? The big, big depression. Correct. The valley of death. Um, what, is something, what is something else that you notice on this chart? The next thing. Massive, massive payoff. 1.5 to 1.7 trillion dollars of capital equivalent to the market cap of Silicon Valley. Fourth biggest capital market in the world right here in Australia. What's the next thing you notice? Eight to nine billion dollars on the, this side of the curve, eight to nine billion dollars invested in the creation of technology, R&D, by the government across all in educational institutions. It begs the question then, how do we mine this amazing technology asset, and that's eight to nine billion dollars every year for the last 15, 20 years, building up this treasure trove, this Pandora's box of a technology. How do we mine it and connect it with the Silicon Valley market cap equivalent that's here in our country, the fourth biggest capital market in the world? How do we do that? Um, and that problem is Australia's innovation dilemma. Um, I was at DeVos a few years ago, and I don't remember numbers, but I remembered three. 4, 12, 81. Does anyone know what 4 is? Fourth biggest capital market in the world. 12th. 12th largest investor in R&D in the world. I'll leave it for the audience to guess where we're 81st at. Um, so it's very hard to cross this valley of death. And take you back in time, um, I spent the last quarter of a century building startups in the United States and towards the end of my career investing in them. And uh, every single one of them um, came very close to dying multiple times in the transition across the valley of death. And I pose the question to make it relevant to this audience, um, how did we do that because we didn't have crowdfunding, we didn't have the freemium model, and we didn't have data analytics. So my first company, like my first love, um, I knew nothing about marketing, fundraising, never met a VC, didn't understand banking or finance or how to run a company, but I was a pretty good scientist. So I wanted to raise money. I had phenomenal investors, Bank of America, Visa, MasterCard, 37 credit cards. I raised $249,000 on 37 credit cards to fund the company. So this was the 1989 version of crowdfunding. <laughs> <laughs> Not the best way to go, but Visa was easier than VC, and possibly still is. Um, so imagine I'm running this company, I've invented this amazing piece of technology, um, I'm paying off, I'm rotating the balances on the credit cards every six months to keep the low introductory interest rate, but it's starting to catch up with me. And there's no personal exemption from bankruptcy or credit card debt, so even if you declare bankruptcy, you don't get out of it. That's why crowdfunding is much better. So I'm, I'm running out of money, I'm not able to make payroll, and I'm working on this problem, chaos theory. Chaos! My God, that's as bad as looking into black holes to invent Wi-Fi. Optical chaos. So I solved this problem called the green problem. It was the thing that prevented the creation of the world's first semiconductor, all solid state, visible laser. So we created this technology, dramatically miniaturized the size of the lasers, and then we had to figure out what to do with it. it took a year to invent the technology, took two years to figure out who cared and what market was important. And it turned out that, like, in every market, there was this massive entrenched competitor. I'll just call them the Borg, but if anyone knows the laser industry, you know who I'm talking about. And they succeeded by assimilating everyone else's technology and absorbing companies. Big, ugly, nasty competitors that create fear, uncertainty, and doubt when a startup comes up. Well, the only way to fight the Borg is with 
um, Star Trek and data. So these lasers in this particular industry that um, we were fighting were very large, very bulky. In fact, it took a truck and two technicians to drive across the country to deliver a laser once it was sold and to install it. You needed three-phase power, you needed water cooling because the lasers were very inefficient. Once you shrink it into a small package, the thing that data's holding is the laser. It's literally the size of your hand. The box is the, the medical device that it was put into. Once you shrank it that much, and that was all enabled by the solid state technology, suddenly you could disrupt the business model. Now you didn't need to put it in a truck, you dropped it in a FedEx box and you FedExed it anywhere in the world to satisfy a customer. More importantly, you didn't have to sell it to a hospital because you didn't have this massive infrastructure overhead, you could sell it directly to a clinic. So we tripled the size of the market. The, the hallmark of great innovation is it doesn't disintermediate other people, it doesn't pick other people's pockets, it grows the pie, it grows the market bigger and everybody wins, but especially you as the, as, as the company doing the, the, um, the innovation. So one of the other things that we did that was very innovative in the medical industry is ask the question, well, data beat the Borg, what else can he do? And we put a modem inside the laser so the laser could phone home. Initially, this was to ensure that it was working properly because it was self-set up by the customer, so you wanted to make sure of the, the health and safety of the device. But over time, we amassed a massive amount of data about the clinical settings for different treatments. This was an ophthalmic device treating eye disease and literally saving sight. So that massive data, even then, in the 90s, was very, very valuable, collected over, this, uh, over the internet. So the argument broke out in the company, what do we do? We should sell it, we should monetize it, we should use it to you know, sort of protect the market. What did we actually do? We made it freely available to the entire ophthalmic community so that they could all share what they were doing. Incredibly stupid thing to do according to our investors and to some of our board members. But interestingly, let me go to the next step and I'll finish what happened. Um, so here we are, growing, successful company. All of a sudden, Hillary and Bill start talking about reforming healthcare. The market evaporated overnight. No one was willing, no doctor was willing to buy a medical product because they didn't know what the reimbursement would be, they didn't know whether there's gonna be massive changes in fees, and even the best of therapeutic physicians are driven by money, they've gotta pay the bills. So our market evaporated. Imagine, you're on the growth curve, you're heading towards IPO, suddenly your sales stop, but you've spent money, you've scaled up for growth. What are you gonna do? The, the free data portal, all of that information we made available gave us an amazing customer intimacy, gave us an amazing connection to our customers because we did things that other companies didn't do. The other thing that we did, so we were connected to them and they didn't want us to fail because we had beaten the Borg. We had a whole different paradigm for medical. The other thing that we did is we found a disease called uh, retinopathia prematurity. If you've had a premature child, you may have experienced this where the child is born clinically blind. And the symptom of this is the blood vessels in the retina grow at an accelerated rate, and if you don't stop that, the eye becomes completely non-viable. It literally fills with these rogue blood vessels, so the child is blind. The standard of care back then was this thing called cryotherapy, where you take a liquid nitrogen probe and you freeze the eyeball. And this little guy here, who literally turned around bankruptcy for us, this little guy here was the first patient. If you look at the eye on the right, that's the cryo eye. So liquid nitrogen probe, freeze the eyeball, the kid screams, the head swells up, the heart usually stops, has to be resuscitated. These kids are in intensive care. They're in the ICU for six weeks usually. So it's a very highly invasive procedure. Eye on the left, we treated with a laser. Why? Why wasn't the laser used for this? Well, because the physicians were trained on visible lasers and visible lasers don't go through the white part of the eye. It gets absorbed and you cause damage. They didn't know that you could make a different wavelength of laser light. They didn't know that you could go in with a wide beam that wouldn't burn the retina and you could focus it inside the eye. Classic example of mixing two very different domains of experience and creating an amazing innovation. What did we do with this? Completely against the instructions of our board, which was try and sell this product, try and sell the IP to another company to save the company so we can stay alive. What did we do instead? We built 40 prototypes and we shipped them for free to any physician in the continental United States who wanted to treat a premature child. It was the first freemie for preemie. 
85% of those physicians found a way, come hell or high water, to buy the product. Not only did that, they bought our stock. That's why we didn't fail. Now, it, it really doesn't matter whether the company succeeded or failed. We had achieved our objective. We were missionaries on a mission to revolutionise this industry by leveraging this technology that we had, we had created. By the time we were at this stage, the reason every single person in the company went to work was the letters we got from the mothers whose baby's sight we'd saved, from the wives or husbands whose spouses' sight we'd saved, because we treated um, age-related macular degeneration as well as diabetic retinopathy. That is, it's the energy of that startup. That was the energy, not money. The money was a byproduct of success. It wasn't the mission. The mission was to change the world. And that's why we survived. When we took Iridex public on NASDAQ, we created a large number of millionaires from one team. Roughly 17 startups got spawned in Mountain View, right next to where Google is today, actually in between Google and Microsoft, interestingly, physically. Um, and we sold hundreds of millions of dollars worth of product. Of the 17 startups, you can still see seven of them in that area today. This is the, the virtuous cycle of entrepreneurship. Creation of a successful company then spawns other companies and they cluster. Israel outperforms Silicon Valley per capita by, I think, about a 20% margin on innovation because Intel put Fab Six in Haifa in 1972 and started this tech cluster, as well as the innovation of the Israeli people. Amazing clustering effect of innovation. So since that time, I built five and a half startups. I did them all exactly the wrong way, backwards, fell in love with a piece of technology, went and figured out what to do with it, managed to get two of them public, managed to sell the other four. Um, Surprisingly, despite doing everything backwards and having no real business training, being a scientist, still managed to not have any craters and create a lot of success and a lot of wealth. Um, I had this question, scientists, what is the obligation of a scientist? Is it to create science or is it to create solutions? This is the dilemma, part of the innovation dilemma, that our country is, is wrestling with right now. We fund science and the creation of technology. It's our duty. It's our duty as scientists to take responsibility for that technology and be sure it delivers the value to its fullest potential in all the markets that Australia needs for our future. Every one of the companies had a near-death experience. In fact, none of them would have been successful if they hadn't had the near-death experience because there's nothing like hitting the wall at the end of the week to dramatically focus you and stop you trying to boil the ocean and find the one place where your technology really matters. So after a while, I realized that, you know, maybe I was doing it backwards, but it was just the way I had to do it. I was a scientist, so I started with technology. This, this near-death experience, it wasn't an accident, it was a catalyst. It was the turning point for each of these companies that got us to really focus and, and figure out success. I was going to do a shameless plug for Zedings here. I'll, I'll still try and do it. I asked this question at a big private equity conference about uh, a month ago. So just by show of hands, who thinks... Um, 50, you can do the vote, that's fine, but in parallel, in real time. Um, by show of hands, who uh, thinks 50% of um, job creation in the last 30 years in the US was caused by startups? Show of hands, 50%. Okay, 40%, 30%, 20%, okay. So that's exactly the answer that I got at the PE conference. That's the, I don't know, a few hundred billion worth of, worth of superannuation funds. That was their collective wisdom, exactly what you just said. I'd be really interested to compare the Zedings poll. It's actually 100%, so the answer isn't on the Zedings poll. 100% um, and just Google uh, Stanford or Harvard, um, Bob Joss, I can't remember the Harvard guy. Thanks, if we can just go forward. 100% um, of the job disruption. Now, George Foster did a follow-up study from Stanford showed that roughly 75% of the job destruction comes from startups. So there's a 25% net gain there. Um, the reason I want to do the plug for Zedings, um, it's possible for the presenter to completely influence the choice of the audience. Um, by asking it 50%, 40%. If, if I'd said 50, 60, 70, then people would have gone the other way. 
So the Zedings magic, of course, is to anonymize the voting and not let me interfere with your, your votes. Um, just let me finish on this. Entrepreneurship is, is like alchemy. Um, in its truest sense, when you, when you really are swimming in a blue ocean, alone, um, no competitors, working on a zero billion dollar market like Oculus Rift, trying to do something really hard, the chances are overwhelmingly high that you'll fail. But if you're missionaries, failure doesn't exist for missionaries. No matter what happens, you run out of money, you go raise more money. Um, you can't raise more money, you get credit cards. You can't do credit cards, you do crowdfunding. Whatever it's going to take, you keep the company alive because you're on a mission. Your team is on a mission. In those times where we were hitting the wall, where we were facing bankruptcy, we couldn't make payroll. Nobody left. I'm not, I'm not, zero, zero people left the company. Yeah, we handed out more equity, but we handed out quite a lot of equity to start with. It's why we created so many millionaires when we were successful, because we really believed in sharing the wealth. But that lever meant we stayed alive when others didn't. I ran venture-backed startups through three recessions and through 9-11, none of them failed despite those recessions, because of this fundamental passion and commitment that comes with being a missionary. When you're swimming in that blue ocean, it's possible to create billion dollar companies in, in zero billion dollar markets. Um, if they're successful, they really create this virtuous cycle. So I think the elements are here in Australia, I believe, and I've spent quarter of a century in Silicon Valley kind of watching this evolve, getting to the tipping point where I thought coming back I could actually make a difference. I think we're so close, it just needs a little nudge, it needs us to get our boats kind of sailing in the same direction. I think we can really put a serious dent in Australia's innovation dilemma. And that is the most important mission any of us could do for our country in this generation. We're going through a decline in commodity cycle and it'll be a long decline, I suspect. But even if we weren't, there isn't such a bright future in digging up raw material from the ground and selling it as raw material, commodity product, to other countries and then buying it back at several orders of magnitude increase in price. That's not a good place for any country to be. So we have this massive investment in technology, we have a massive capital market. All of us, but in particular our scientists, need to get better about becoming missionary entrepreneurs because that will propel us out of a dependence on pure resources to a much broader, much more vibrant innovation economy. Thank you.